Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would want to take you through the rise of Madam Lizzie Mabanduanyo Ike while she was on earth. My name is Alan Yenga. We are going to read the theology in English. And on the last pages, those who may not understand this language, you can follow through and understand. Theology of Lizzie Mudoni Wanyoike Ali Rise. Our matriarch, mentor, role model, mother, grandmother, rose from humble beginnings. She was born at Gadukeine village, location 15, Muranga district on the 5th November. 1951. She was the born of the late Peterson Kariuki and the late Naomi Wangeshi. Surrounded by the love and support of her brothers and sisters, John Gadage, the late Udias Wangare, and the late Fresia Joki. Jones Jologe, Sylvia Wabui, David Mugabi, Samuel Maige, Lecho Wagekoyo, and Joseph Kirago. Lizzie came from a very ordinary family, growing up in a rural setting, enjoying the blood and blood of all manner of characters from her mother's breast womb. As it was during those days, Lizzie grew up helping her parents attend to their farm, and also helping her mother in house shows. She was focused, resilient, hardworking, and committed child, traits that defined her throughout her adult life. She was not, however, without mischief. She could at times claim credit, even in tasks that she did not accomplish personally. Being a sixth born, she was pampered by her elder siblings who could assist her on some of the tasks given. While at school, she picked up the habit of sucking her thumb, which was condemned her teachers, but in vain. She always claimed that it gave her solace, especially in a mad class, which she passionately described. Education. Lizzie, Lizzie's education journey began at Gadukeine Primary School, where she laid the foundation for a lifetime of learning. She sat for her common entrance examinations three years later and progressed to Kiabugi Intermediate, where she sat for the Kenya African Preliminary Examinations, CAPE and passed. Lizzie later joined Kahuhia Girls up to Form 4. Her parents wanted her to join Kagumo Teachers Training College to become a P1 teacher, a career that she was not enthusiastic about. She managed to convince her father to allow her to proceed to Form 5. Her wish was granted and she later joined Nakuru High School for Form 5 and 6. While in Form 6, a team of well-wishers from Britain visited their school, scouting for students interested in pursuing further studies in the field of business and secretarial studies, with the aim of becoming high school teachers. She was amongst the students who were selected to join Kenyatta College, present-day Kenyatta University, to pursue a diploma in teacher education with a bias in secretarial studies. Ironically, during her entire education, she had a dislike for mathematics subjects. Interestingly, 
This dislike did not prohibit her from becoming one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time. Marriage and family rise. Lizzie met the love of her life while she was in her last year in Kenyatta College. As it was during those days, girls were extremely cautious about relationships, knowing very well the consequences should this information reach their parents. This was not exemptional to Lizzie. Her friendship with her soulmate blossomed, and in 1972, she got married to her sweeter, Josephat Buru Wanyoike. Together, they were blessed with three children, Anthony Buru, Stera Wajiro, and Elik Karioki. Lizzie was mother in love to Anne Wajiro, David Buru, and Peter Getau, a doting grandmother to Ayana Wajiro, Shayana Mothoni, Ethan Boro, uh, Jonathan Gige, Sidney Boro, Shasha Kelich, Jay Boro, Shemio Mothoni, Rizzi Mothoni Kriyoki, Ian, Sirip Degwa, and Rizzi Mothoni Wanyoike. Together with her late husband, Lizzie ensured that all her children accessed quality education and were lucky to never miss any privileges about their learning. She was keen to help them appreciate the importance of education and her presence was felt throughout their academic journey. Lizzie brought up her children doubling as a career woman and a mother. She was a strict disciplinarian. She was actively present in the lives of her children as they grew up. She was dropping and picking them from school, helping them with their homework, and also instilling values of responsibility in them. She mentored her children to become individuals of value and substance in the society and also appreciate those who were less fortunate. Since her husband was a corporate titan, she spent most of her time with the kids, learning errands together, going to church and holidays and road trips with her children in her black period. Occasionally, Rizzi, has talked about how she managed sibling rivalry amongst her children. She could talk about how the firstborn son, who is Tony Wanyoike, was not happy when she got him other siblings. Her children describe her mother as loving, caring, compassionate, understanding, supportive, nurturing and forgiving. She reprimanded where necessary and rewarded where deserved. Whenever you found Rizzi seated with her children, you could not help but notice a very strong board they had created together. She had a tightly knitted family and was free with her children. None of the children would have a reason to hide anything from her. Although Lizzie was financially endowed, at no one time did she spoil her children by making them feel entitled for what she owned. She instilled the spirit of hard work in all her children. She had a big heart and welcomed all Sandra to her home. She welcomed her younger sister, Rachel Kareivi, and brought her up as her own daughter. She also welcomed her niece, Penina Bogua, with open arms to her home and nurtured her. It was difficult for one to notice that these were not her own biological children. In Lizzie's marriage, the world opened its doors and windows wide open for her. In her first year of marriage, 
She went shopping in London and also traveled all over Europe and eventually to the US. Lizzie loved traveling outside the country with her favorite destination in Switzerland. While in the country, she would take several road trips and from Mombasa and to and from Mombasa with her loving husband and children. Although Lizzie had a very busy schedule, she always created time once a year to take a vacation. Lizzie had the finest taste of country music and slow jam. Kalia. Lizzie had an industrious career in the education sector, full of life, fun, and excitement. After graduating from Kenyatta College, present day Kenyatta University, Lizzie started her job as a teacher at State House Girls High School. She taught for a year before resigning to take care of her children. When her children attained school age, her desire to embark on her career path as a tertiary institution trainer was reignited. She got a job in Temple College as a secretarial studies trainer. The owner, Mrs. Willis, an elderly white woman, who was soon to retire, was the proprietor of the college. Lizzie became one of her most royal and dedicated lecturers, and as a reward, she was promoted to the position of deputy principal. After five years of active service, it was apparent that she had settled to Lizzie to become the institution's principal. Mrs. Willis eventually approached Lizzie and asked whether she was in a position to buy off the institution. Lizzie was excited about that proposal and she approached her husband. The purchase and transfer was effected. Mrs. Willis left for the country and Lizzie took over as the principal and director of the college. Under the leadership of Lizzie, Temple College grew twofold. 99% of the students were from Uganda, Tanzania, Sudan, and few from Kenya. The corrupts of the East African community in 1977 came with very serious ramification to the existence of Temple College. The countries that were enrolling majority of the learners withdrew their students, and the risk of survival was now squarely on Lizzie's shoulders. She had to be creative to remain afloat. Lizzie had to think fast if she wants to make the college thrive again. She could not live with the reality of laying off her members of staff and shutting down the college. Lizzie casted her net into the local waters to get students. She thought of a promotion drive that took the market by storm. In the 80s, not many private institutions had a promotional campaign going in the local media. And so she launched her charm offensive on air. Those were the days of media monopoly where the only channel was the voice of Kenya that was later to become the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, KBC. The media houses were also not used to hosting local entrepreneurs to campaign for the national economy, and therefore they embraced Lizzie with both arms as they gave her free invitation to its Swahili, English, and Gekoyo service station. Those who were born then remember that the only Kikuyu broadcast service aired its programs for a few hours in a day. Those are the days when the late Gaiduma, Wake Mumu, and others were the station's rebs who hosted guests, and their popularity with the masses then worked well for her promotion agenda. At the English service, Lizzie worked with Sarah Kehara and Simon Gigi as her hosts, and by the grace of God, she created an impact in the local market. Temple College underwent a rebirth that made it popular and most sought after privately owned secretarial college. It was the best performing college in Pittman's and City and Guild's exams. 
Graduates from the college were highly sought by both public and private organizations. Apart from just getting the skills, the students were molded into respectful and responsible individuals. At Temple College, Lizzie invented a work plan that to endear her to parents who had placed their children at her training care. Training institutions back then were not known for discipline. Lizzie devised a clarion call for hard work, discipline, and excellence as core values to Temple College. She established a rapport with her students where she aspired to have a face-to-face -face engagement with them as many times as possible and inspiring them. At that time, Rizzi was a very strong young, was a very young mother scaling the heights in an era where it was fashionable to associate women with household chores, cooking, cleaning, and just being a wife. Lizzie was rearing to go. In line with the then emerging market trends, Lizzie felt the urge to diversify other academic programs, IT, business, accountancy. By the very nature of business partnerships, decision-making at times take longer. Lizzie felt the time was right for her to independently pursue her dreams. She had garnered adequate experience and exposure to navigate the academic sector. As the philosopher says, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Lizzie set up a small team of confidants led by James Mwangi of Equity Bank, then Equity Building Society, to brainstorm on the new venture which gave birth to Nairobi Institute of Business Studies. In her element of resilience and determination, Rizzi rented out a room in Pioneer House along Moy Avenue, which was to be the home of the new baby, Nairobi Institute of Business Studies. The space was small, and in, uh, and in overcoming this, upon realizing that the floor had a double volume, she looked for architects and engineers to introduce a floor within a floor in a bid to double up the space and address the spacing challenge. Within two years, Nibs had become a household name with an ex exponential growth in, st in students' population which led to a spillover to the corridors. She made makeshift classes along the corridors. The demand for training was huge to the point that learners would opt to defer enrolling from an already full intake to the subsequent intakes, just to secure a slot as a student in Nairobi Institute of Business Studies. In 1998, after the attack on the US Embassy, which was a adjacent to cooperative bank building around Helsilasi, tenants vacated to pave way for innovation. In two or three, renovations were complete, but the tenants were reluctant to take up the space. Lizzie, with her college and business acumen, took up two floors and open up, opened up an ultra-modern campus in the year 2004. The entire building was empty and students could roam around moving from the top to the ground for freely. The building had ample parking, which made it easy to attract both day and evening students. Corporates could sponsor their employees to undertake various professional courses at NIPS. In the year 2005, the space became small and Lizzie took over four floors in agriculture house building along Harambe Avenue to start paramedical courses. This did not augur well with the regulatory bodies, that namely Pharmacy and Poisons Board and Kenya Medical Laboratory Technician and Technologist Boards. One morning in the year 2006, Lizzie woke up to find her business name as a headline in one of the local dairies, indicating that the college had been closed down, allegedly for non-compliance with medical regulatory bodies. This was a major setback that proved her, that provoked her to pursue the matter in court. Her resilience gave her motivation to travel to India 
and source for all necessary medical equipment that the two boards required. In the subsequent inspections, the college was given the green right to continue training in paramedical courses that saw thousands of young men and women train in diploma in pharmaceutical technology and diploma in medical laboratory technology. Today, these technicians are heading giant institutions locally and abroad. Lizzie's desire to see many young people acquire a diverse set of skills led her to start other academic programs, such as legal studies, which was a preserve of the Kenya School of Law. Lizzie could dare swim in uncharted waters with courage. In year 2007, a number of tenants had showed interest in taking up space at Cooperative Bank House, and the landlord felt that a college was a nuisance in the building. They wrote to Lizzie, informing her that they shall not renew the tenancy contract with NIBS for another period. Again, she went to court and obtained an injunction. This setback came with a silver lining as it opened up her eyes that one day she could eventually be thrown out and inconvenience the training. This made her look for rad elsewhere with a view of setting up her own premises. This search ended up in Ruiru, Kiabu County, at a place called Kimbo, where she set up an ultra modern spacious training facility on 17.5 acres of, acres of land. In 2009, Lizzie made up her mind to relocate NIBS from Cooperative Bank House to Ronald Gara Post Office building along Ronald Gara Street. NIBS had become a household name, and this attracted young enthusiast runners to pursue training despite the fact that the street was perceived to be insecure. In 2010, the ultra modern training facility duped Thicker Road Campus was complete and was opened by the then Assistant Minister for Planning and MP for Gatanga, then Honorable Peter Kenneth. This establishment changed the entire economic landscape of Kibo area. Needs characterized economic activities within the area making it one of the fastest growing centers in Kiambu County. Lizzie was keen on the provision of affordable quality training, which saw her immensely invest in the new facility. Opening the campus came with a myriad of challenges, keeping in mind that the, the Fika Road Superhighway was under construction from NIPS, one could see Kirimabogo Hughes since no investor was interested in setting up any investment around the area, which was perceived to be unviable and insecure. In her characteristic pacemaker, in her characteristic pacemaker element, Lizzie braced the challenges that arose mainly from insecurity. Unfortunately, Two months upon opening the campus, thugs broke into the facility and made away with equipment worth millions of shillings. Two weeks later, NIPS was raided again, and unfortunately, two security officers who were deployed to guard the premises were killed. This was very sad and a trying moment for Lizzie, and she was at her lowest and about to throw in the towel. However, her resilience and determination in fulfilling her vision superseded the challenges. Around 2015-2016, Lizzie embarked on a journey to set up a university. This was a smooth sail for her as she did put up together an able team to steer the process. She made available resources to attain the university status. She recruited a vice chancellor, Professor Miriam Moita, and midwife the process. At the 11th hour, Lizzie had a change of heart due to the prevailing hype of institutions converting to universities. He bothered her that this mass exodus from technical training to university 
could rock out very many students who do not meet the entry grade to universities. Additionally, one of the conditions to set up a university was to drop 70% of the diploma programs. It was Lizzie's belief that the provision of quality training was a sure way of breaking the cycle of poverty in the society. It was her conviction that even those young Kenyans who scored raw grades in KCSE deserved a chance to acquire skills that will enable them become self-reliant and actively contribute to the economic development of the country. She made up her mind to disengage from the process of transforming NIBS to a university, but instead rebrand to a technical training college, despite being awarded a letter of interim authority by the Commission of University Education to offer four degree programs. This is transformational leadership. At the helm of NIPS, so the institution evolved from a secretarial college to become the largest private tertiary institution in Kenya, offering a variety of market-driven academic programs in various disciplines. Currently, NIPS boasts of an enrollment of over 5,000 students across the three campuses and a legacy of graduating hundreds of thousands with various professional courses over the years. Lizzie has left behind an indelible mark in tertiary training sector. The entire journey of Lizzie and Nibs is an ending and cannot be documented in full. Nibs Guest House and the Emory Hotel. Lizzie established Nibs Guest House in 2003 as a local joint for Nyama Choma and drinks for the residents of Gireleshua area. This facility doubled up as a restaurant and on job training facility for the hospitality students that are taking their training at Nibs. Unfortunately, in 2006, fire laced down the facility completely to the ground. This was a blessing in disguise for Lizzie, as she, for a very long time, had issues with her staff ranging from poor management, theft, to lack of accountability. She had grown tired of the facility. This gave her an opportunity to rebrand the facility into a foster facility. In 2015, construction of the Emory Hotel commenced in earnest. Lizzie had purposed the facility to offer commercial services and also serves as NIBS hospitality students during practical training and internship. Construction ended in 2018 and the hotel opened its doors to the public within the same year. Lizzie's desire to provide livelihood for young Kenyans has seen, has seen her employ over 70 permanent employees who entirely depend on the hotel as their source of livelihood. Lizzie Wanyoike Preparatory and Senior School. Lizzie always had a desire to establish a learning center which will offer a strong foundation right from childhood and give strong values and character as a base for proper upbringing of these children. She had observed that the negative behavior amongst some of the students at college level was as a result of weak upbringing at elementary level of education and at home. She identified this gap and in January 2021, her dream was realized through establishment of the Lizzie Wanyoike Preparatory and Senior School, which is strongly grounded on values and character. Her efforts both fruits in 2022 when four pupils joined various national schools across the country. In the year 2023 KCPE examinations, another set of four pupils joined national schools with the first candidate joining Kenya High. Born in a town uh, Anglican family where her father was a lay leader, Lizzie was introduced to Christianity at a tender age 
in SEK Gatukeine Church. Later, when they relocated to Kireaine, she joined SEK Kagajo Church, where she was baptized and confirmed. When she got married, Lizzie joined her husband, who was fellowshipping at PCA St. Andrew's Church, Nairobi. After relocating to Kuna, she went back to Anglican Church and joined St. Mark's Westlands, where she has been fellowshipping and also an active member of the Ladies' Fellowship. In 2022, she joined ACK, St. Joseph's of, of Alimathea Thome, which was closer to her residence. Lizzie's journey with the SEK Church was not just a path of attendance. It was a profound commitment to faith, service, and community. She embodied the true essence of a Christian, consistently demonstrating love, compassion, and a deep-rooted dedication to her spiritual walk. Those who witnessed Lizzie's unwavering faith served as a guiding right for those fortunate enough to know her. Her presence in the congregation was more than attendance. It was an embodiment of the teachings of Christ, marked by kindness, generosity, and a genuine concern for the well-being of others. Lizzie was actively involved in numerous church activities, from the choir loft to the Sunday school classrooms, she lent her talent and time selflessly. Her dedication to nurturing the faith of the younger generation was truly commendable. One of Lizzie's most remarkable qualities was her ability to bring people together. She had a heart that welcomed everyone, creating an atmosphere of warmth and inclusivity within the church community. Her genuine smile, kind words, and open-hearted embrace made her a source of comfort and, inspira and inspiration for many. Beyond the walls of the church, Lizzie lived out her faith in her daily life. Her actions spoke louder than words, and her commitment to justice, love, and mercy reflected the teachings of Christ in every aspect. Due to the nature of her work, Lizzie found herself cutting across different denom denominations where she was invited as a motivational speaker and a beacon of hope for women, men, mothers, and young people. And young people, Lizzie was a, light, uh, a living testament of the transformative power of faith across all denominations, community, and social life. Lizzie was not just a person who gave. She was a beacon of generosity and compassion a shining example of what it means to selflessly uplift others. Her philanthropic endeavors touched the lives of many, leaving an indelible mark on the hearts of those fortunate to, uh, to be recipients of her kindness. One of the most remarkable aspects of Lizzie's philanthropy was its inclusive nature. She believed in reaching out to every corner of our community ensuring that no one felt left behind. When it was providing support to families, facing financial hardships, extending a helping hand to the elderly, or championing causes that aimed to empower the marginalized, Lizzie's heart knew no bounds. Her commitment to education was particularly noteworthy. Lizzie recognized the transformative power of knowledge and was a passionate advocate for making education accessible and affordable to all. Countless students have benefited from her scholarship, each being a testament of her belief in the potential of young minds. The, result, the results of this initiative motivated her to write her first book entitled Empowering the Youth Through Training. During her interactions with members of the community, Lizzie used to come across several households with bright students who have completed their elementary education but cannot access higher education due to lack of funds. Through her personal initiative, as well as that of Lizzie Wanyoike Foundation, 
she managed to offer scholarship to over 300 beneficiaries. Some of these beneficiaries are still in college, while others have secured gainful employment. Lizzie's scholarship cuts across primary, secondary, and tertiary colleges to universities and was not only limited to bright needy students. Her conviction that education would, uh, would break the cycle of poverty made her offer scholarships to needy cases with exemplary low grades. She believed that the poor performance might have been precipitated by the vicious cycle of poverty and wanted to offer these students a chance to break that cycle. Ladies and gentlemen, Lizzie was always concerned that the number of needed cases were, increasingly exponential, uh, were increasing exponentially. Although bothered that she could not be in a position to assist all of them due to the limited resources at her disposal, Lizzie had faith that God would provide a way because she had the will. Lizzie's acts of kindness were not limited to education. In 2020, she did set up an ultra modern dental unit complete with a computerized dental chair in Roiro Level 4 Hospital, Kiabu County, to address the gap in the hospital's ability to provide quality dental services to the public. Lizzie is recognized that the community thrives when its members support one another, and she took it upon herself to ensure that no one in Ruiru went to bed hungry. Lizzie had set up a food program in Pika Road campus, which was more than a charitable effort. It was a lifeline for families facing economic hardships, a symbol of hope for those in need. She went further and supported those who needed to get into economic ventures to sustain their livelihoods. Lizzie has supplied several motorcycles to young men to run their Boda Boda businesses, as well as opened small retail chain businesses to others so that they can have a source of livelihood. All these initiatives drew a lot of admiration locally and internationally, making Lizzie win coveted accolades such as the Ernest and Young Entrepreneur of the Year Women category in 2018, Dyer Award Entrepreneur of the Year, the Top Women in Business Award, the Trailblazer Women in Business of the Year uh, Award in 2018, and was also among the top 100 Kenyans in 2021. Lizzie was also appointed by the chair uh, as, a, as the chair, Kenyatta University Alumni Association Interim Board by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Wainaina. Lizzie's philanthropy, uh, Lizzie's philanthropy was not merely a financial contribution. It was a personal investment in the well-being of others. Her hands-on approach, be it in volunteering at local charities or organizing community events, showcased her dedication to making a tangible difference in the lives of the less fortunate. In times of crisis, Lizzie was a pillar of support. Her acts of kindness extended beyond material assistance. She offered a shoulder to lean on, a comforting word, a reminder that even in the face of, diverse, uh, even in the face of adversity, there is hope and compassion. As we bid farewell to Lizzie, let us carry forward the torch of her philanthropic spirit. Let us be inspired to embrace the needs of our community, just as she did, and to find joy in the act of giving. May her legacy of philanthropy, uh, philanthropy rise on, uh, live on in the countless lives she touched. And may we be motivated by her example to create a world where kindness knows no boundaries. Parting is such a sweet solo. Lizzie had enjoyed a lifetime of good health until 2018 
when she started developing acid refract symptoms. She got treated at Aga Khan Hospital, but the symptoms did not completely disappear. She could complain of head congestion, though it was manageable. The year 2022, Lizzie started losing weight and feeling tired, uh, which slowed down her normal work routine. Around February 2023, she was diagnosed with cancer, which was at an advanced stage. She went to India for treatment, and after, uh, and, and after her chemotherapy, she bounced back. She bounced back to life and even managed to get to Grace Nib's 14th graduation in October 2020. Around November, she started developing complications that saw her go back to the hospital. Early January 2024, she started vomiting and developed difficulties in walking and was admitted in Aga Khan Hospital. She was later discharged and went back home where she was observed at a nurse care from Aga Khan. On the fateful morning of Sunday, 14th, the nurse called the family at home where she was recovering and informed them that Lizzie's organs were failing and at around 12.30 noon, Lizzie took her last breath, surrounded by family members. As we celebrate the arrival of an exemplary lady whose humility would not have permitted her to see or refer to herself that way, we pay growing tribute to arrive of love, service, and dedication to the less fortunate. Fear thee well, ma'am. Treasured Shosho, sweet sister, cherished auntie, beloved friend, and an honored colleague, you have been truly strong to serve. To God be the glory. Blessed and sure, 